All right, students, so this is the um, chapter seven lecture notes that I'm going to record and um, put online for you. We're going to um, go over a little bit of this in class, but I wanted you to have something that you could look at to study for your test because this chapter is kind of a culmination of several things we've talked about chemistry wise, physics wise, energy wise, diffusion wise. Um, and so I want you to really get um, a good handle on this one. And it's one of the more important. Uh, biological, you know, biochemistry uh, type processes. So it's cellular respiration, and um, cellular respiration is when your body take or the cells take glucose or some other product. We're going to focus mainly on glucose because um, it's one of the more common uh, molecules that goes through the process. You take glucose, those carbon atoms are all bonded together and we talked recently about chemical energy being stored in those bonds you're also going to oxidize this glucose molecule and remove some electrons from it uh, taking electrons from glucose and then moving them to another process also transports energy and, and that's the that's the goal of cellular respiration is to produce energy and to produce energy that is usable for your cells so that they can go and do all these other uh, processes that they need to do all right well in respiration you know when we talk about organisms that do respiration where we typically talk about heterotrophs um, you know organisms that live on the organic compounds that are produced by others but really autotrophs do respiration too. You know, plants have to do cellular respiration. Photosynthesis builds the glucose, um, but the plants will then take that glucose and put it through respiration. Some, some students are confused that plants do photosynthesis, animals do respiration, uh, which is partially true, but plants also do um, cellular, uh, cellular respiration. Well, respiration is just a series of reactions. You know, well, everything is a chemical reaction, but um, re make sure you remember that being oxidized means that you lose electrons. So electrons are taking or taken from some molecule, and being reduced means that you gain an electron. And if, if something loses an electron, something will have gained an electron. They don't just um, disappear. Uh, so if something is getting oxidized, there's also something getting reduced. It's a, a coupled type of uh, reaction. Uh, and then dehydrogenation is lost electrons are also accompanied by protons, typically. Uh, and in this case, um, we're going to see that those uh, electrons, when a, a molecule loses an electron, will also lose some protons. And those protons will play an important role in respiration. We'll get to a point when we mention a, a, a proton pump. And, and the proton pump itself is very important uh, to respiration. So redox reactions are reducing and oxidizing reactions kind of smashed together. So electrons carry energy from one molecule to another. So one's reduced. One's oxidized, which is why we call them redox reactions. Uh, nicotinamide adenosine dinucleotide is the molecule that we're going to talk about that will be getting reduced, and it's abbreviated NAD+. Now, uh, the plus is there because it has an overall positive charge, and we know that if you have a positive charge, you're you can accept a negative charge. You know you attract negative charges. NAD plus is an electron carrier. Um, it, it's like a dump truck. And like dump trucks in the real world, they can be empty or they can be full. NAD plus is an empty dump truck. It does not have extra electrons that it's carrying. Now, whenever... NAD plus accepts two electrons and a proton because of the dehydrogenation. It becomes NADH um, because it's no longer positive. It, it accepted two electrons. 
and it gained basically a hydrogen. The reaction is reversible. That's important. Um, the reason I like to use a dump truck as an analogy is that, you know, if you're at a job site, you fill up a dump truck with dirt, the dump truck will then go somewhere else and NAD plus will go somewhere else too, and they will dump off the dirt. Well, NADH will get those electrons, go to the electron transport chain, dump those electrons off, and now it becomes NAD plus again, and it can come back to the job site um, and pick up more electrons, okay? That's, it's, it's important to know that it's reversible and reusable um, because we're going to talk about this process of fermentation where we need a, a supply of empty dump trucks, basically. This is the, the process by which NAD plus gains electrons. And so here's NAD plus this little curved molecule here. There's some enzyme. Uh, I don't remember what the enzyme name is, but it bonds to NAD plus. It bonds to some energy rich molecule like glucose. And because this uh, enzyme works the way that it does and then oxidize in an oxidation reduction reaction or a redox reaction, two electrons and a hydrogen end up on the uh, NAD molecule. And so now it's <coughs> NADH. So, you know, in overall energy harvest, dozens of these reactions take place. A number of electron acceptors, including NAD plus, uh, end up um, taking electrons from high energy molecules like glucose and uh, moving that energy to some final electron acceptor. And we're going to talk about what that final electron acceptor is. Well, in aerobic respiration, which is respiration that occurs in organisms that require oxygen, well, oxygen is the final um, electron acceptor. In anaerobic respiration, the final electron acceptor is some inorganic molecule. Um, sometimes it's sulfur, uh, sometimes it can be methane, but it's just not oxygen. And then you have fermentation. Uh, fermentation occurs in aerobic organisms when they don't have enough oxygen. So when there's not sufficient enough oxygen to complete um, the respiration, then those electrons have to go somewhere, right? Just like the dump trucks. The dump trucks are full. They have to dump their dirt off somewhere. Well, if you can't dump them off to oxygen, then what will happen in fermentation is you will dump them off to some other molecule, um, therefore freeing up uh, the dump truck to pick up more electrons. So we typically talk about glucose, you know, C6H12O6, oxygen yields carbon dioxide, right? So because we took these carbons here and we um, broke them apart, right? So we unbonded them. And if you break the bonds of those carbons, then you end up with carbon dioxide, water, plus, of course, energy. So this is an exergonic process. We see a negative free energy um, because this energy is released from the glucose. So it lost, the glucose lost this much energy, but we take this energy um, and use it to build ATP. It's a large amount of energy, to be honest, for a, you know, a little molecule, so it has to be released in small steps. If we released it all at once, then um, it would be very bad for your cells. Well, I don't know what happened there. All right, well, electron transport is really where we get a lot of our energy from. So, um, and we're gonna see all these steps, but this is just kind of an overview. So whenever NADH picks up those electrons and they take them to the electron transport chain, it's almost like that, um, that, that kid on the slide that we saw. You have electrons high up here with lots of potential energy. And as they move down 
the electron transport chain, they end up at the bottom. Um, they bind with oxygen here to form water. But this energy is released, and so energy released is used for ATP synthase. Well, uh, electron carriers like NAD+, you know, a lot of carriers are used, um, but we're going to focus on the NAD+. There's also an FAD that we'll mention, too, that's a lot like NAD+, um, that acquires two electrons and a proton. Um, but just know that there are other electron carriers inside the cell, but we're only going to discuss uh, the NAD uh, and the FAD. Well, when we saw on that graphic that um, the energy used from those electrons is used to synthesize ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. You know, it has those three um, it has those three phosphates in there. You know, and if you use ATP, it breaks off a phosphate, and now you have ADP and an individual phosphate. And what your cells do is they use the energy from those electrons to take that phosphate and stick it back onto ADP. Um, so here we see ADP, adenosine diphosphate. There's just two. Here's an individual phosphate. Here's an enzyme, and um, this enzyme works with uh, PEEP and pyruvate, you know, releases pyruvate to form um, ATP. Now, this ATP goes off and does work somewhere, um, muscular work, cellular work, um, all kinds of things. Well, now we're going to get into, you know, what does glucose have to do with all this uh, electron carrying and ATP producing? Uh, this is really the steps of cellular respiration, which is glycolysis. We know that the word lysis means to split apart. So we're going to take glucose and we're going to split it apart in a series of steps. And then we're going to um, oxidize pyruvate and go through the citric acid cycle and then the um, electron transport chain. All right, so when we look at uh, aerobic respiration that uses oxygen, um, we see here that glycolysis occurs out in the cytoplasm of the cell. It does not occur inside the mitochondria. Well, during glycolysis, we're going to take glucose and we're going to split it into this one, two substances of pyruvate. So we have a six carbon sugar here, and we end up with two three carbon pyruvates. The other thing that happens is some ATP is generated, not a lot, but some. And what we have here is we have some electron carriers being produced. Now, these electron carriers, if you follow it down, end up at the electron transport chain, which makes sense, right? So here's the dump trucks picking up electrons at these work sites. Uh, and there's that FADH. It's the same kind of electron carrier. That's just structurally a little bit different. And they dump their electrons off at the electron transport chain. And then the, we have NAD+, which is the empty carrier, and FAD, which is an empty carrier too. Um, we see some carbon dioxide coming off of these um, reactions because whenever you unbond the carbons, they get released um, as just carbon dioxide inside the mitochondria. And then you get some ATP produced. And here, this one, this one should actually be bigger. This is where the bulk of the ATP gets produced during this chemiosmosis ATP synthase stage. Well, glycolysis, this part here, converts one glucose to two pyruvates. It's a 10-step pathway, um, occurs in the cytoplasm, and there's a net production of two ATP. And the reason that it says net is that you actually produce four ATP, but you have to spend two ATP to kind of get it started. Um, and we'll see what that looks like here. This is kind of small, I realize. I'm going to see if I can like expand this up for us. So here we have 
a six carbon glucose molecule. And what happens very early on is you have this um, priming reactions, much like a spark plug in your engine that's required to kind of get the gas going. We have to spend two ATP here in order to turn this six carbon glucose into six carbon sugar diphosphate. And by adding this energy, it causes the carbon that causes the glucose to split into this three carbon sugar. And then through a series of steps, you know, going down through, um, look what happens here. You have NAD plus, which is the, an empty carrier coming in and picking up electrons. Same thing happens here. We also have ADP turning into ATP here, 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 and here. So we spent two units of energy here, uh, but we made four down here. So that's why it says it's a net of two. And we basically spent two dollars and made four dollars. The process will continue then um, into um, this. Well, this is the same process. Um, this is the other process. Sorry, it went back on the slide for me. Uh, but this just kind of shows it um, in a little more detail uh, about what happens, how you make the ATP, um, and how you get the NADH. Um, but, but I want you to um, make sure you understand um, that the glucose is here, we spend some ATP, and we make some ATP. For glycolysis to continue, NADH must be recycled to NAD+, all right? which means that the full dump trucks have to go and dump their electrons off somewhere. right? If you're just hanging out, sitting around, doing schoolwork, whatever, you have enough oxygen available to your body. And so therefore, uh, NADH is dumping off electrons. It's doing its job and it's doing just fine. But let's say you're exercising or running or something uh, and you're not getting enough oxygen to your muscles. Well, then your muscles don't have enough oxygen. Those NADHs have nowhere to dump their electrons off. And so what they do is they donate the, that um, electrons to things like pyruvate, uh, which doesn't really produce a lot of energy, but it does free up uh, those electron carriers. And so pyruvate itself, uh, if there's oxygen available, it will um, go into the mitochondria um, where it gets oxidized to this thing called acetyl-CoA, which then enters the citric acid cycle. Some of you may know it as the Krebs cycle. Um, citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle are the same thing. Um, but without oxygen, pyruvate is reduced uh, in order to oxidize NADH back to NAD+. Remember, those um, electron carriers need somewhere to dump off those electrons. And that's what we call fermentation. So um, here we see without oxygen, um, pyruvate will um, get do electrons donated to them from NAD plus, plus and turn into lactate, or um, we do lactate fermentation. Um, certain organisms will donate, will, will turn pyruvate into acetaldehyde, donate electrons that way and produce ethanol, which is how we make whiskey and beer and liquors. But with oxygen, um, you'll pick up electrons and uh, pyruvate will become acetyl-CoA and enter the citric acid cycle. Um, this, so this is what we just talked about there. Um, from each of the three carbon pyruvate molecules, right, um, there was glucose, which is six carbons. Um, pyruvate is now a three carbon, and there's two of them. right? So we started with six carbons. We still have six carbons. Um, we end up with one carbon dioxide. Um, 
and it kind of breaks off and again breaking a bond releases energy we pick up electrons and uh, acetyl coa then proceeds to the citric acid cycle so this is what happens so we had glycolysis here pyruvate enters the uh, mitochondria we break off a carbon dioxide so this is one of the reasons you exhale NAD plus picks up some electrons to take to the electron transport chain and you form this thing called acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA then will uh, join this thing called oxaloacetate to form citrate. Uh, citrate gets rearranged, loses some carbons, decarboxylation, um, and it will regenerate oxaloacetate because it is a cycle. So here we have acetyl CoA joining with oxaloacetate to form this six carbon molecule again so we put two in right we had three carbons of pyruvate right so we had three carbons here we lost one so two of them come in and it goes through this series of stages where we pick up some electrons we lose a carbon we pick up some electrons we lose another carbon and we're back to four well we generate some ATP we pick up some more electrons we pick up some more electrons and we're back to oxaloacetate which is how it completes the cycle well the citric acid cycle uh, releases two molecules of carbon dioxide we saw that here here uh, but we also importantly um, produce some electron carriers right and those electron carriers are really where we're going to get the bulk of our energy from this is the citric acid cycle in a little more detail um, you can look at this and it tells you the names of the things and you can see um, the same uh, NADH is being produced and ATP is being produced so glucose has been now oxidized to six carbon dioxides we've totally broken all the bonds we've produced four ATPs 10 NADHs and 2 FADH2, so these two electron carriers. They'll then proceed to the electron transport chain, and uh, electron transport has released about 53 kilocalories of energy by gradual extraction, and that will be put to use to manufacture ATP um, outside of the uh, electron transport chain. So the electron transport chain is a, a chain of these electron carriers um, it's in the inside membrane of the mitochondria and this is where those electron carriers go to dump off their electrons um, this is the kind of major complexes of the electron transport chain here uh, let me kind of like zoom this in so we can see it a little bit better so here we have the electron carrier bringing and dumping electrons off and hydrogen and hydrogen ions which are protons by the way um, and I want you to pay very special attention to something because as these electrons move across this protein and these electrons get dumped off here too what's happening is that this protein here is basically a proton pump it's taking protons from this side and it's moving them across to this side now if you pump a lot of protons across <clears throat> then you build up this concentration gradient you have a lot of protons on one side of the membrane and we know because of diffusion if that happens these protons want to flow back across and when they flow back across where they go is through this thing called ATP synthase and ATP synthase as protons flow through it actually spins and they form ATP Uh, this is what we just mentioned the accumulation of protons in the membrane and so this is kind of an overview of aerobic respiration in mitochondria. Um, I hope this video helped. 
Um, I want you to read the rest of these slides, though, about ATP synthase, what it is. Um, there's the structure of it. Um, the energy yield that we get um, from glucose. Um, here's some yields of respiration, some information that you can look at. Uh, respiration is regulated by feedback controls. Right, because we don't want to burn up all the glucose we have all at once, um, or we would probably catch on fire. Um, and so glucose is controlled. You can read about those that information there too. And we, we mentioned uh, oxidation without oxygen. So fermentation, uh, aerobic respiration. Uh, some organisms use methanogens uh, for uh, electron acceptors and some use sulfur uh, to do a, um, like these things in mud flats um, can also do respiration too. Uh, we mentioned fermentation and so we saw this and here's just some further information about uh, fermentation too. Uh, your bodies can catabolize proteins which is not good, not great for you. So if you run out of sugar um, then you can break apart amino acids. Um, you can deaminate um, amino acids to produce um, some molecules that can go through respiration, but it produces a lot of ammonia and urea. Break down fats. Um, it's an oxygen dependent process too. Uh, and it also yields 20% more energy than 6-carbon glucose. So 6-carbon fatty acids actually make more energy, which is why it's um, useful for us to store our extra energy as fat, um, because we get more energy from it than just the sugar itself. Uh, this is that process. You don't have to memorize this process here. Uh, and this is just kind of an overview of how energy is extracted in cells. You can take a look at that. Um, this is kind of a, a hypothetical timeline of, you know, evolution of metabolism, you know, the ability to store chemical energy in ATP. So ATP was probably first. Uh, and then glycolysis came along where we took sugar, split it down and produced ATP from it. Uh, glycolysis is a pathway found in all living organisms, bacteria, fungus, plants, animals. Uh, and then, um, Photosynthesis was um, part of the metabolism, but this is without oxygen because it used sulfur. Uh, and then using water in photosynthesis instead of um, hydrogen sulfide. Um, and this began the permanent change in Earth's atmosphere. Um, and then you came along with nitrogen fixation and then aerobic respiration evolved probably most recently. Uh, and that's it. So if this helped, um, actually, if you watch it and it did help, um, you know, email me and let me know. You can also make suggestions on changes or things you'd like to see.